What is going on, everybody? This is Mark Cardula, the lead faculty and CEO here at Modern Pain Care, where we make you the complete clinician. I want to welcome you this morning for another episode of the Modern Pain Podcast. Appreciate you guys all being here. Talking about a topic that's near and dear to my heart, because I've dealt with this personally myself, uh, at multiple flares of disc herniations and issues. And uh, looking forward to the discussion today. There's been some discussion on social media that our co-host has been involved in and some uh, interesting critiques and different things that we've uh, heard coming about. So thought it'd be a good topic to talk about. But uh, before we get into disc herniations today, how are you doing, Jared Hall? I am doing phenomenal. Uh, you know, when the ca- when the camera wasn't panned over to me, uh, I was I was showing my true inner nerd. And I was, um, well, you know, me and one of my really good buddies that I work with, uh, another physical therapist, we, we, we play chess. And, you know, the Queen's Gambit, I don't know if you've watched this miniseries, pretty epic, pretty good miniseries on Netflix. I uh, got my chess juices flowing again. So I've been in like a, I've been in a couple day chess match with my buddy playing chess with friends. <laughs> Dude, chess, honestly, well, reading philosophy, playing chess, you're just, you're just astute. You're just a, a, a impressive human. I uh, have been watching The Office of, on Netflix for the, probably my wife and I, probably for the fifth, sixth time through, just gives me some good laughs every time. Never gets old uh, for me. So yeah, I can't say I've been watching any amazing or playing chess, uh, but uh, good on you, man. Good on you. So, so tell us a little bit about this disc herniation, because I, I think it comes out of the blog you did for Trust Me, Dot physio. I can't remember the exact website. I apologize. Uh, but uh, what what what's the background behind the old disc herniation talk that we're having today? Uh, well, so you know, I haven't actually been involved with the the conversations this most recent time, just because I've been involved with the conversations a, a thousand times before. I like maybe four or five years ago, I, I wrote an article on my own blog page uh, back when I used to blog pretty frequently called um, "Discs Don't Slip." Damn it. And uh, I think both Trust Me, I'm a Physio and Physio Network, I think this one in particular might have have been posted on Physio Network, uh, have kind of reposted that blog and linked back to my website and everything. um, Just because I I guess it was it was pretty popular read and, 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 you know, it always stimulates discussion. Um, And I, you know, I, I saw this most recent time that it was posted. There was a lot of discussion on it. There's patients that chime in, you know, people that maybe aren't uh, clinicians and they, they have questions and, uh, you know, that they, they give some insight into their own experiences. But also I, I have a tendency to see a lot of clinicians, a lot of people comment on the article without actually reading it, right? They, they, they do the whole thing where you read the headline, you read the topic, and then, it, then they throw out a comment that if they would have just read the article, which is not even that long, it's maybe like a thousand word article or something, uh, they wouldn't have listed that comment, right? They wouldn't have posted that. They would have said, oh, never mind. It doesn't say what I thought that it actually said based on what the, what the headline is. And, and of course, when I, when I wrote that title, I wanted it to be a little bit provocative because I was so tired of hearing patients that have been told, oh man, your disc is just going to like, shoo, shoo, shoo. it's just going to slip out. It's going to fly out. It's going to shoot across the room. It's going to be like the bar of sho- soap in the shower type of situation. So I wanted it to be like a pretty attention grabbing uh, headline. And I guess clearly that worked, but now um, some nuance needs to be added to the discussion. As always, the discussion, you can just, you, I mean, and when you make a blog post, heaven forbid you make a title that's a little provocative, but, you know, so people read it. That's kind of what you're supposed to do when you make a blog post. Of course, but some of the stringent, how dare you do anything that's provocative. You should do everything just by the realm of science and no other, you know, you should not use any strategies that engender emotion and, and make somebody want to read something. But anyway, yeah, it, it, it's interesting because I think most of us who are listening to this, I would clinic, clinically hear this day in and day out, The you know, my disc is slipped. Um, and one of the criticisms in the post was, well, well yeah, the, the, there's material that does escape and it does technically, I guess, yes, you could say, yeah, the, the nuclear material can slip out and, and herniate for sure. So it, it, that 100% happens. In the context of that blog, I don't think that's anything of what that blog had to talk about. And like you said, I don't think it was read and understood that the, the message was really because if you think, yes, if we want to nitpick over research and biomechanics of the disc and stuff, yes, nuclear material can slip out. There's no doubt about it. It can get to where it you know, impinges on a nerve. It can create an inflammatory response. You get a raging radic going down somebody's leg. Um, but 
I don't think that's what patient, patients and that when I talk to patients and ask their thoughts on it, because I, I don't, I'm not one to speak about what patients think. I'll ask them, what, what do you think? And it's often things are moving, slipping and sliding like, uh, you know, a, a bar of soap underneath that, the two vertebrae where the disc moving like a unstable entity under there. So that's the, the message that in the perception that I'm hearing when I ask the person who has the perception what it is. And, and yeah, again, we can nitpick the, the, the nuclear material and we should, cause I mean, it's important to understand that there is this are this robust, uh, thing that doesn't occasionally have, I mean, they can be robust and strong if you do give them the appropriate loading strategy, of course, but they do get injured. They do get hurt. They do cause specific, you know, nociceptive issues. I think sometimes we get to the point, I think maybe it's motivated a little bit out of, you know, some folks, and I still have yet to meet this person, but there's criticisms of the, well, this person's way over to the pain science thing where apparently they're divorcing the fact that tissues can get injured and discs can herniate and that's all just, you know, in your head. And again, I've not met that person uh, who holds that view, but that's a p common criticism that I hear about, well, you're one of those pain science guys, uh, you must just talk to people. I'm like, where, what are you talking about? But anyway, yeah, I, I think it's important to understand kind of the context of where that discussion comes from with disc herniations because massively misunderstood thing from the general public. So what's, what's your uh, experience with trying to calm that, that uh, perception down, I guess, or, or, or work with that perception with the patient? Because again, you gotta, we're meeting people where they're at and we're, we're giving them a place to validate their views and seeing if we can maybe move them. Because obviously if you're, if you're moving under the preconceived notion that things are slipping and sliding there, I don't know if that's going to engender a lot of confidence and moving movement uh, for your for patients. What do you see, Jared? I mean, first, I would just like to add, I, I just like to start by saying, like, if you are somebody that uses the term slipped disc or discs can slip, uh, the only question I want to ask is, like, explain to me, please, the value that that provides to a patient. Explain to me the value that that description provides to, to anyone listening to it. Explain to me how that's a better usage of language and a better explanatory model than something that may actually be more physically accurate and something that may be less psychologically, uh, you know, offensive, really. So um, you can argue, yes, like you said, that certainly the annulus uh, of the disc can, can be damaged and the nucleus propulsus can, uh, you know, move out through that damaged, you know, spot in the, in the annulus, you can have, it's essentially a ligament tear, right? Because the annulus fibrosis is made out of, uh, you know, different types of collagen, type one, type two collagen. It, it has a composition really similar to, to a ligament and you can tear that ligament and then you can have, uh, you know, the proteoglycan substrate that the nucleus propulsus is made out of uh, kind of, leak out, so to say. And of course, the, the theory is that the, that, that proteoglycan mix might have a lot of uh, little chemicals in it that are highly, highly uh, no, no susceptive creating chemicals. And if they are to touch a nerve root, then they, they create this, you know, really aggressive inflammatory response and so on and so forth. Um, but, you know, patients come into me Oh, you know, just, or just people in general, you know, you, you hear the, oh, I slipped a disc back when I was in my 20s. I don't do that anymore. I, you know, my uncle, I, he slipped a disc when he was, uh, you know, lifting weights. So I don't lift weights. And, and my friend, he slipped a disc doing back squats. Back squats are, back squats are terrible for you. That's where you slip discs, right? It, it, and time and time again, you know, like if you ask somebody, well, what does it mean to slip a disc? The, they say, like, as, as you mentioned, oh, it's, it's like a hockey puck. I've literally had people say, well, you know, you have the discs in between your vertebrae and they're kind of like hockey pucks. They're a joint in there and they just shift out of place. I'm like, no, dude, if this happened, you're paralyzed, like period. Like that, that, that doesn't, that, it, the, the spine doesn't work that way. Um, so it's a really, you know, delicate situation that you have to navigate with people to, you know, just like anything, if you're, if you're going to update their beliefs, um, you have to first recognize that the beliefs that they have right now, they probably come to believe through, uh, you know, a variety of, of different reasons, 
be it personal experience, family experience, news media, other healthcare providers. Uh, and if you're going to come in and you're going to be the one contrarian, and if you do that in an aggressive way, it, it's probably unlikely that's going to go over well. So um, I'll oftentimes, you know, talk to them about, oh, you know, like, uh, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know that this is actually a slip disc. I think you have a little bit of a disc bulge, but it, it's not actually, you know, it's not out of place. It's not slipped. You have a, you have a little bit of an injury on the, you know, the backside of that disc and it is bulging out a little bit and you, you've got some inflammation there. And I think that that's what's going on. But, um, you know, we, we used to think that discs could really slip out of place and all that sort of stuff, but, you know, new MRI technology and everything is kind of showing us that they do get injured, but they, they don't actually slip out of place. We've kind of figured out that they're super firmly anchored on each end. So you don't have to, so I start saying like it's the yes and right or it's the validate plus you, you validate their beliefs like oh totally and I, I thought that and you know this is this is the evolution of our thought processes and would it be okay if I gave you a little bit more information right or can I, t can I tell you a little bit more about how this works uh, trying to come through the back door and maybe reduce how much concern that they have that this thing first is going to slip out of place right uh, so that, that's kind of where I would start is like try to come to a mutual agreement that this thing doesn't slip out of place. And then maybe that opens up the door to talk about healing. Maybe then the healing opens up the door to talk about progressive loading. And maybe then the progressive loading opens up the door to talk about building robust structures in the low back and, and you know, progressive overload and building a, a mindset about the spine that's not so uh, hyper protective. Yeah, yeah, and I, I one of the cr crazy things I know people don't think you do this, but we actually speak about anatomy to people, and it's and again offering it as, hey, I completely get that that sounds horrible when you think things are slipping and sliding out. Would you mind if we spend some time talking about the disc, and so we can really get a good understanding of what can be happening in your back, and then have that discussion of you know this thing is physically anchored into your vertebrae it's not like it's a mobile unit under there so and i'll tell people you know the the, the models out there unfortunately are not all that helpful because it makes it look like that thing's a, a, a an entity of its own it is actually incorporated into and i have some pictures and different things just so people can get an idea of how that is but now and i'll say you know the kind of what i think the slip is is what people is exactly what the criticism is is that you know sometimes there's some material on that disc that can bulge out or can even sometimes escape the disc um, and, and cause some problems. It can cause a big inflammatory response, and if it's hitting a nerve, um, then it can you know, cause some issues with pain, numbness, weakness into your leg. Um, and then I usually will share my battle stories of, of my disc and my S1 radic and all that stuff, and, and, and talk about, hey, back doing everything 100%, no surgeries and all that stuff. And then just, again, talk about healing too, because if you look at the research on disc herniations and, and, and prolapses and things of the disc, the worse that thing is, the better chance your immune system is going to resorb that. And as Jared had mentioned, you know, the proteoglycans and things are very, you know, when the immune system gets contact with them, the thing, when they're nice and contained in an annulus, the immune system doesn't have a lot of uh, ability to interact with them. But when it escapes the annulus and gets out into the general uh, population, I guess, of our body, the immune system can go buck wild and have a pretty wicked immune response and painful neuro, you know, neuropathic pain as a result of that from the inflammatory issues that it go on around nerve roots but yeah it's it's just one of those things that it's okay to talk anatomy and, and but again conceptualizing in a way that's helpful for a patient that provides hope for a patient that shows the body's amazing ability to heal that shows yeah this sucks it, it, it causes a lot of pain the, and the beautiful thing is that this will get better as long as we can you know and obviously we're, we're still doing our red flag things we're still doing our hey Cauda equina, uh, are we showing progressive neurologic loss? Are we showing significant decline in neurologic function that says, hey, we probably need to have them, you know, move forward up up into more, you know, urgent consults with neurosurgical or, or other type folks who can help with that. But um, I'd say the vast majority, even folks, you know, when I first had mine, and I know I keep blaring my horn of my issue, but that's how I work with patients. Like I could not do one standing heel raise. I had zero reflex, and the outside of my left foot was completely numb and you know i of course catastrophize like normal humans do when you're when you're in wicked pain and you're all of a sudden you're losing sensation and strength in your leg and of course i went down to oh god i'm gonna need surgery and all these things and then i'm like okay pump the brakes you tell people that this stuff will heal all the time why don't you let it try to happen for yourself and then you know time and and 
just good rehab and all that stuff and it got better and again back 100 percent still have a little bit of a sensory loss on the outside of my foot as far as it doesn't feel quite the same but it uh strength wise is 100 percent and does well but again i th- there's just i think that is probably one of the biggest tissues in our body that has such a horrible misconception and fear inducing information around it and a surgical industry that is just not shy to, to put a put a needle and scalpel to start gobbling out discectomies and laminectomies which I've actually d- referred people to when I don't get them better. I'm not going to by any means be, you know, ignorant to the fact that there are people that need surgery that, you know, d- despite our best efforts do well. But how do you kind of use I mean, when you when you see folks with disc herniations, Jared, what, I mean, what's what are you looking at with with somebody to say, hey, you know, maybe this thing ain't working with with PT. I think we got to be humble in our approach. and I know we are. But uh, what are you looking for to say, man, this ain't cutting it. Uh, we're not maybe getting you where you need to be. I mean, definitely the red flag stuff, right? If they're losing control of their bowel and bladder, then get out of my office uh, type of situation. But, you know, if it is, you know, purely pain related, especially if it is just pain related uh, and there is not severe motor deficits or anything like that, then it's it's time, right? I've got I've got to give in the data shows, right, that on average, symptoms really start to resolve decently well between like, you know, at about eight weeks, you know, between six and eight weeks, symptoms are, are starting to, to get better. And that sounds, that sounds terrible, right? It's like, man, I've got to live with six months or six weeks of hell. It's like, well, I mean, maybe, maybe, I don't, you know, I don't know if you go and get rushed into surgery, it's going to take, it's going to take you a week and a half to two weeks to get into surgery anyway. And then you're going to have two weeks of being sore as hell from surgery. And then you've got to start the rehab process right after that anyway. So you're in the same spot (laughs) either way. It's like, you can, you can wait this out or you can deal with surgical pain and paying a surgical bill and the possibility of actually waking up and having, you know, complications of surgery and all that sort of stuff. So if it is pain with those people, I, I, I'm just really trying to engender some form of confidence and, and give them pain management strategies, anything that will work, right? Uh, and I am not opposed to manual therapy. I'm not opposed to heat. I'm not opposed to ice. I'm not opposed to e-stem. I'm not opposed to whatever is going to help that person live their life while that thing starts to heal. And that's what I tell them. I'm like, hey, look, you essentially you, you kind of have a little ligament sprain in your back and it it leaked out some some you know material that causes a just a ton of inflammation and it's on that nerve and that nerve is the most sensitive structure in your entire body the little dorsal i show them the little bulb this little dorsal root ganglion this sucker right here it's more sensitive than the cornea of your eye think about that if you got some inflammation on the cornea of your eye that makes you just like want to just not be alive right so you got some you got some terrible stuff going on right here and i know that this is this is miserable but you're not showing me the signs that you need to jump on the operating table and those signs are and i make sure that they know them hey if you have bowel and bladder problems if all of a sudden your leg just starts to like go dead if your foot just starts to like kind of flop and you get this terrible rapid onset of of foot drop Hey, this, that's that's serious, and, and that needs to be addressed. But if it's bad pain, if it's numbness, but you still have pretty decent strength, and even some strength loss it is okay, right? Because strength loss can be pain related, it can be inflammatory related, and it's not necessarily a pure physical nerve root compression. Difficulty is, you know, that's a great area for us as clinicians. That's a great area for patients, and, and the the mantra has been get that person into surgery if they're losing any strength, right, in the past. But now there's been a few studies that actually let people go. And, and you see that even if they have a, a fairly significant strength loss, uh, that'll be back to normal within three to six months in, in a lot of cases that doesn't continue to progress. So, you know, I'm just a little bit more cautious now. I'm like, hey, let's, let's wait another week or so. And, and, but if they're not getting better, at all they have no symptom improvement in about eight weeks then i might consider saying you know what this is this is injection time or or this is uh maybe considering a micro discectomy or something like that uh but it's again it's the, the if anybody like has the answer they're lying to you because this is science and it's just not it's just not clear cut and you you kind of have to 
take each patient as they come and, and a little bit individual. Yeah, and I think it's the context the patient operates into. Like if, if, if they, there are some patients who, yeah, obviously athletes, they do not get six to eight weeks. They just, you know, especially professional athletes, that sucker is discectomied within, you know, the moment the MRI shows, it's let's go, let's get it out and get you, get you, you know, and honestly, I, I'm not aware of any amazing data to show, like, and I don't even know if they've even tested it out of just, I think, athletics you know, tendency to want to just cut stuff out. Have they ever given an athlete, hey, what, let's have these group of athletes get a discectomy. This group is going to roll through the process. And I, I just, again, don't think it happens as much as far as those natural history isn't really given its time in, in professional athletics or even just, you know, other athletics. I've seen, you know, folks want to get back on the field and they think surgery is the magical fix and stuff. And it's not to say discectomies are bad, laminectomies. I think we're recognizing that let's not throw any hardware near the back. I think that um, I just read another quote from Tim Flynn back in the day that, you know, spinal fusion is the lobotomy of our time. And I think it's an interesting quote and definitely has some merit as far as how that, that procedure has taken off. Dis despite that is one, one procedure, I think, where the, the procedure horse is so far in, in front of the evidence cart or the procedure cart is so far. I don't know. I, you know what the, the quote is, but it's, <laughs> there's not a lot of evidence to support it, yet it still happens rapidly in our country. I, I didn't have enough coffee today. But anyway... Yeah, I, I think if people can roll through that six to eight weeks and if you prepare them and say, hey, I'm going to be with you here, I'm going to help you through this, it's not going to be enjoyable. And, and I'll tell people, I remember pacing the floors at two in the morning with raging leg pain, like tears roll on my eyes because it was horrid. Um, and, you know, can't sit in the car to drive to work without, you know, wanting to like, you know, trying to, you know, position yourself to unload things. And it, it sucks for a bit of time. But you know, but it's going to get better if you can give it time. And, you know, I mean, and if it doesn't, we're going to get you in front of some people. Um, but, you know, we have good evidence to show that this is a, a viable path to get you there. It's going to, you know, six to eight weeks. We'll, we often see people getting significantly better. Um, I see no reason why that won't be you. Um, but if for any reason we're not seeing you get there, then we'll obviously. And it's often that like two weeks, three weeks, at least from my experience of just like, you know, DEFCON, holy cow, life is not easy. But if you can get some people some pain modulating, symptom modification stuff, maybe some positional stuff. This is where I do think, you know, MDT, McKenzie, repeated motion specific exercise, whatever you think, uh, whatever you call it, uh, it can be very helpful because it's just, you know, symptom response to repeated loading strategies of the spine and they found some clinical patterns that tend to work well um, for folks. And that definitely has been very helpful for me. I mean, often the posterior annulus is the problem. So flexion loads are going to load a, a strain, a ligament issue in the posterior disc. So why don't you not flex for a little bit often, not saying all the time, because we can always get lateral shifts. And uh, when I've had my herniations, I was a S curve looking in the mirror because I was so crooked. But uh, yeah, it's, it's an interesting thing. And I think we just have such a industry that has profited off of that finding. And it continues, I think, just out of probably sunken cost a lot of times with some of our uh, surgical colleagues and there's a lot of surgeons and orthopedic surgeons and spinal surgeons who are as aware of this issue as any and are very I've, I've come across many who just go to PT let it calm down if you still are having problems come see me but um, again I think you know if you're if that's what you do that's what you're trained to do your passion is is wielding a scalpel which isn't wrong is just are you going to be a little bit biased to apply it to to humans it's just it always amazes me too how many people get to surgery without even a, a breath of PT or even a, a mention of it for some of that things. And I think we got to help our primary care colleagues do a little bit uh, better job of giving people options that are viable and not just our biased options here as PT, because of course we're biased, but and chiropractic. But man, there's a lot of research to support that that's just as effective as as uh, surgical care in a lot of cases. So why not go that route if we can help people do it? But again. It's easy for that to be done because a lot of patients come in with uh, beliefs that are really rigid of, man, I don't even know why I'm here. I'm just checking the box. My insurance company said i got to be here for six weeks before they're going to let me get this surgery I need. So um, we've had these discussions before, but like when you when you encounter that in the clinic, Jared, where that's the, the, the like, I don't know why I'm here. This is a waste of my time. I mean, what's what are some ways you knock that down to, to help somebody maybe consider that there's options for them to do well in, in conservative care? Uh, well, <laughs> so I've actually started, you know, being a little bit more blunt with patients sometimes. And when they say, well, you know, my insurance company just said I have to come here before I can get a surgery. And I say, well, you know, th those insurance companies, they get a bad rap because they are pretty crappy sometimes. But 
the reason that they're sending you here is because they know that <laughs> there's a lot of evidence that you'll actually get better if you come here. And they know that I cost about a tenth as much as a surgery and, and, and I can get you better for 10 percent of the cost. Um, if, if I didn't do any good, if they didn't have any evidence that PT didn't did anything, they would not waste extra money sending you here <laughs> before doing the surgery. They would rush you into the surgery. And uh, I, that hasn't worked every time, but a couple of people have said, well, damn it, that makes sense. <laughs> like, they're like, oh, yeah, those insurance companies, they want to save money. They wouldn't pay for PT for no freaking reason and then <laughs> pay for surgery. They, they, I'm like, look, man, they, they know that this works, so they're going to send you here because they have a lot of evidence that this works. Um, so that for, for some people that are, you know, financially minded and, and, and kind of business minded, uh, that has really went over well. That's not going to work for everybody. Um, but, uh, you know, I hate giving canned strategies. And th I, I say this when I wrote a book on canned strategies to to, <laughs> to help people explain pain better. Uh, but I, I don't like giving canned strategies so much anymore just because uh, – everything has to be molded to that particular person in front of you. And, and it's your job to get to know them. So you have some sort of insight into what might be a good avenue of discussion or experiential learning or whatever it might be to, to help that person prove to themselves that they can get uh, better with PT, right? Uh, and, and, you know, I, I, I say help them prove to themselves because if you're always trying to prove it to them, then that doesn't always go as well as, as setting up the pathway for them to prove it for themselves. Yeah, no, I think if you can set up clinical scenarios where they, and, and I had a patient yesterday for, it was a cervical radic, but, and it, it she, she was, and I had a student with me, so it's always fun when students see this, they're like, oh my goodness, but it was just, you know, typical, like, oh, it's in my shoulder blade, raging down my arm, horrible, have to like support my arm, and we just did, you know, she's got the typical, she's at Zoom meetings, it's horrible for her to be, and neck flexion just kills her. We start working into retractions, and it's boring. I used to, like, not like, for whatever reason, because it wasn't my magical Jedi hands getting in there and, and sensing things and fixing things. I just could never get my ego around Mackenzie helping things. Those retractions are ridiculous. Um, but lo and behold, we did a bunch of retractions, and her pain in her arm goes away, and she's like, oh, my God. And she's like, you know, ready to, you know, bake me a cake right there. In the, and the, but it's, it's just interesting. I mean, if you can set up clinical scenarios where they see a pretty horrible situation change in front of their eyes, and I'm not saying that always happens with retraction or repeated extensions at the back, but it definitely can show people like, and that's where test retest and showing people, especially when you can see something, I can't freaking walk without my leg raging, and you go through a, a bout of repeated extensions, or you might even do some mobs to the back to help engage into extension better, whatever your your mode of operation is, and they get up and they're like, oh man, it's feeling better, and I'm walking better. I think at that point, you're sold, you've, you've sold the patient oftentimes when they see, oh my God, they, they, he's not lying, this this crap can change, and I'm, I'm actually moving better. And that's where sometimes if I'm just, uh, I'll have that discussion with people. I completely get it. You know, based on what you read and you hear about this, there's no reason to think that I'm going to have any help with you. But all I ask is you just give me a chance. Why, why don't, if you're going to spend six week, weeks with me, let's see if we can make it a worthwhile six weeks for you. At worst, your back will be stronger and move better and be more successfully poised for surgery. So at least see if they're mm -hmm. open to it. And a lot of patients are, will get open to it. And then you, you just, you, that's where your job is to sell what you do to patients and selling what you do to patients is showing that you can take their problem and change it for the good in often in session. Now I will say I've had some of the most amazing therapists and highly respected manual therapists when I've had my horrid herniation, I'll tell you, it didn't change. It did change for the first, when it was in DEFCON five level of pain and horror, it just didn't, it just, you know, it was, I had to get off my feet and get some symptom relieving positions and just ride it out for two to three weeks. But then once things simmered down, then definitely helping things move with, you know, exercise and movement. And I'm not saying that's for everybody, but I, so you just got to be able to respond to how things are responding in front of you and not just, oh my God, I'm not making a change with the patient and just say, hey, this is looking like you're in that midst of a lot of inflammation. I think we just got to get you in some positions that manage your symptoms and let's, let's, let's rock with this thing as we roll forward. But when you can, when the patient can show themselves that there's change and possibility for change, then man, you got somebody who's not worried about surgery. All of a sudden that discussion is out the window and they're like, let's go. Uh, but that's your job as a clinician to really create those scenarios and uh, how you talk and all those good things are very important with it. But 
<laughs> excuse me. Any I've, got, other... I've got two things. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say. Before, before I forget both of them, um, one of the things I just wanted to kind of throw out, and I wanted to, I've never asked you directly about this. I wanted to uh, kind of see like your, your own, you know, clinical experience, expertise. Um, <clears throat> I get a little bit more concerned if it's been, well, I get a lot more concerned if it's been, you know, four, five, six weeks and somebody has not developed any sort of directional preference. I can't find anything. can't find anything that relieves it. Whereas, you know, I feel like with the majority of patients I've seen, and I don't have any data on this and I haven't seen a research study on it. And if there is, I would love for you guys to send it to me after this so I can read it. Um, that if there's an acute disc issue, uh, or acute radiculopathic issue, we'll say, um, that it seems like, you know, the first week or two, there ain't no directional preference a lot of the time, especially in the first week. It just, it just hurts. Everything hurts. And then a directional preference starts to kind of manifest itself after maybe, maybe two weeks, two to three weeks ish. Um, so I, that's one of the things that I tell patients early on as well. I'm like, Hey, look, you got a lot of inflammation going on right now that's going to start to calm down a little bit over the next one to two weeks. And we're going to find a direction for you to bend your back or to, to rotate your neck or whatever it is that's actually going to make this feel a lot better. It's called a directional preference. And usually right when this thing starts, you don't have one of these, but as things start to calm down a little bit, we start to figure out exactly what's going to help you, what's going to, what the things are that are going to make this feel worse and the things that are going to make this feel a lot better are. Um, and it, it just seems that that usually happens between two and three weeks, two to four weeks uh, in, in most of the patients that I've seen. I don't know what you've seen. I think it depends, as all answers are. I mean, it depends on the patient in front of you. I think there are some people where, you know, it, it's you, and again, it's clinic response to clinical movements and see. Um, and, and if you're not finding that work, yeah, there is no position of comfort and I can't even get them, you know, in any different things. I think the one thing I would say with like, uh, you know, McKenzie, MDT, whatever you want to call it, is you know, willingness to explore pain responses, but trying to explore them in a way of symptom relief directions, not, you know, hey, let's see if they're going to provoke this thing, especially understanding those symptom irritability things. So I would say that folks that are highly severe, highly irritable, often that they might be more challenging to find a directional preference in that first initial period of time. So you're just trying to just find some symptom modification, positional relief type things. And I mean, I think you can, the lateral shift folks can be challenging. I know for me with that, that's been like where you're in there crooked and it's a bear, it's like, it's like a knee buckling, almost pass out experience when you try to correct that thing. Um, and there's been discussions and I agree with it. Like Louis Gifford used to say, why fricking fight people and wrestle them out of that shift? Um, and you know, and then you hear Mark Laslett, who's published some good stuff on that and you can follow Mark on Twitter, but um, who, you know, definitely, and I'd, I'd say it depends. I'm not going to rage somebody into shift correction if it's an adaptive thing. Like sometimes getting away from a wicked herniation is your body saying, hey, it sucks over there to load right now. And then maybe we're going to start graded loading. But if it's just not there day one or two or, or week one, two, three, then just, you know, find some unloaded shift correcting, you know, you're laying on the affected side, rotation, knees up. I mean, I'm, we're not going to get into the nitty gritty stuff. So they can at least get some symptom relief and find some things uh, to, to position themselves and then ride it out till that two, three week window maybe passes. And it's, it's hard to say. I think two, three weeks is probably accurate, but I mean, it, it varies. Some people, it never <laughs> gets there. And you know, the, the MDT folks will talk about that folks that are non-responders and, and it, it, are symptoms bad enough where you're willing to just let's ride this out and let that six to eight weeks go on. Or is it just so horrible life, you know, changing that you need to see? And I'm okay with that. I mean, that's the person's decision. And um, you know, I would love if everybody just shows conservative care, but um, I get it, man. When that stuff is raging and life is horrible, but again, a lot of that becomes load management away from PT too, where people just struggle. Especially if you know, I've had a guy who's had two discectomies. They're talking about fusing him, but and he drives 45 minutes and and just jacks his back up. I remember for me, just a 20 minute drive to work. You know, I'd be crippled coming out of that, out of my car, and just not not a fun human being to be around for a little bit but um yeah i think you're yeah i would agree i think the, the there are some patients uh, and again it, it depends there are some patients though that are like um you know come to your clinic cannot even stand up straight they're stuck hunched over and you do that like and it sometimes can take two three hours i just saw a post somebody in a dpt student group and i know vincent vince gutierrez was in there helping them out because he's very skilled with the whole repeated motions thing 
um, you know, had them do the whole prone over pillows, take pillows out slowly over time, took a couple hours, and this person walked out, like, thinking, oh, my God, I went from a 10 out of 10, can't barely walk, to 1 out of 10 walking. And that, that was the response I've seen in clinic that made me want to, like, I need to learn that, okay? I need to shelf my ego. And that person, like, had, like, dramatic, like, it looked like a different human who walked out of the treatment room. And I'm not saying that that happens for everybody, but there are some of those cases where you can make some big turnarounds um, pretty quickly with some of these things. But, again, you let the patient's presentation guide that and be okay nudging into some symptom response as long as you understand that whole irritability thing, which is how we teach it, of course, when we start blabbing about it and our complete clinician and all that different stuff. And we've had Vince Gutierrez come in and do a, a talk on repeated motions, MDT types. Not He doesn't teach MDT. He's not an MDT instructor and freely declares that in front of hand because I know there's some proprietary trademark things that we don't want to monkey with, which I think, again, is a issue in our profession. But anyway, um, yeah, so there, there's some good stuff to learn about it. And I think you, it's hard to argue that. And it's I don't think it's uh, some guy, Robin McKenzie, great guy, does some amazing things, looked at clinical patterns that arise when you apply repeated motions and repeated loads to the spine. And he found that, gosh, centralization, peripheralization, uh, directional preference are some helpful things to know and if you can see that and kind of move specifically into some of those directions that people tend to do better c more quickly and then we they develop some systems of treatment but how to assess for it and treat it and I don't think it needs to get all that fancy and, and dogmatic and language and I have to be a, a McKenzieite or a, a, you know it's a, I can't do it unless I'm certified I, I know that's a, d a argument I mean I think definitely you can bastardize anything by just saying oh, I do it and you do 10 extensions, it hurts, and you bail on it. I mean, that's not going through a repeated motions assessment. I'm sorry, but yeah, no, it's I'm, I'm drifting off track. But that's that uh, is <laughs> my long-winded roundabout answer to your to your query. Okay, and then I, I said I had one other thing. Final thing is, uh, it was just interesting. Um, recently on Instagram, I had a post about uh, how you know back pain in, in a lot of a lot of situations, you know, kind of acute, non-specific low back pain uh, might be analogous to the common cold. Um, and, and I had a long explanation as to why. We won't get into that here because I think that could be an entire podcast episode on its own. Um, but a patient, you know, a, a, a random a random person commented on, on the thing and it's like, well, you know, I don't know about this because I, I had I had some back pain and, and uh, maybe he said a ridiculopathy I can't remember he's like and until I got the MR because one of my slides said you know we need to be really hesitant about sending people straight out for imaging and all that sort of stuff it's a lot of most of the time it doesn't change the the, the course of management and it doesn't add any value in in fact it just costs money and, and tends to send people down the over medicalization route he's like well you know I was getting seen by the physio and uh you know we were just hitting a brick wall we were hitting a brick wall we, you know we weren't doing anything good until i went and got an mri and it showed that i had an l5 s1 disc herniation well then the physio changed the approach and all of a sudden i started getting a lot better but then he said but it was a, it was over a year before i actually got all the way better and, and my thought process was you know i i responded to him and said hey man i'm sorry that you had to deal with that that that, that sucks you know nobody nobody deserves to go through that um but I was like, why did the image change the physio's approach? And I, I started thinking through everybody that I see with back pain and that image is that's not going to change my approach. And if a person does have low back pain that's radiating into their leg, I mean, I don't care if it's caused by a, a facet joint irritation. I don't care if it's caused by a disc herniation. I don't care if it's caused by some other form of nerve irritation. I'm going to treat that based on their symptom presentation, their ags and eases, their psychological status, their <clears throat> repeated motions finding, their tolerance to load, you know, all these sort of things that have absolutely nothing to do with whatever the cause, quote unquote, of that pain is. And uh, and I asked the guy, I was like, well, you know, why did this change the physio's approach? Because I, I, I was thinking through it and I don't think that that would change my approach. He's like, oh, well, he was treating it as a facet joint before. And then once he knew it wasn't a facet joint, he could treat it like a disc and he started doing the right things. So I was like, well, I guess that's a problem, right? <laughs> that's a problem. That's a problem with the general practice of, of physios. Yeah. That's, you know, when you start anchoring on a diagnosis and you start treating a diagnosis versus a presentation, that's when it becomes a problem because you start just, it's a facet and then you just, your, your clinical reasoning shuts off. And I'm in the process of 
getting our clinical reasoning uh, course finished, polished up so we can start teaching people to treat humans, not diagnoses. Because if, yeah, if you stick on a diagnosis of a facet, um, yeah, you're gonna. What are you gonna do? You're gonna do rotational gapping. Maybe even drop a manip in there. Which and then there's some flexion, interesting re- flexion, flexion, flexion. Because you got to <laughs> open. You got to decompress the facet, which is gonna tick the tar out of a disc off. But that's where you test retest should show you that pretty quick. Should show you that that sucked. That didn't do well. Um, but if you're like, nope, it's a facet. That's my diagnosis, and we're gonna treat it. Oh, yeah, that's sore, but it's okay because it, we're, it's gonna be sore. It manipulation makes you sore for a while. Well, if they're freaking comparable signs, their functional asterisks, objective asterisks are dumping after your treatments, you need to probably reevaluate. But that's where I agree. I, I don't care if it's a facet. I don't really get excited to name things unless, you know, specific things like I, you can name my L5 S1 S, you know, with S1 radic herniation. There's times where you can. I'd argue we get way too caught up trying to name things when people don't give a shit if you can name it. They care if you can change it and make their life easier and better for them to do what they want to do. Um, yeah, so that's where you got to have a process where it's, 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 and again, symptom response to repeated loads. You should, and if it's a facet, you should see that, well, flexion opening should feel better. And, uh, but, you know, there's also things where, well, it's not radiating down their leg, so it must be, you know, something that's uh, just needs, because there's this belief that, you know, repeated loads to the spine only work if you have ridiculous pain into the leg, which to me is like, there's people have directional preference of like, hey, my strain back hates extension for a little bit. Or if, if I did some cleans in, in CrossFit and hyperextended that, you know, oh, well, it's local. So I don't have to worry about directional preference stuff. No, it's just, I mean, that for me, I was, I've had a few times where extension just blew up my back after being stupid and using poor form. Don't tell uh, CJ De Palma about that, but where it was doing cleans and just racked my back into extension and just did not want anything to do with extension and but flexion felt great um but again that's where you, you treat the presentation not the diagnosis and you have a process that's assessing as a result of what am i doing how is this emerging as changes in there and, and then we can have the, the argument of well within session changes aren't all that predictive no it needs to be life changes outside of your clinic i agree getting excited about them it at least can give you a clue that you're on the right path in the clinic so now can, what do you give that patient to maintain it away from your clinic which i think is the skill we need to get more excited about which we get so excited about changing things on treatment tables and the latest modality to do it whether you needle it scrape it tape it or whatever and i'm not against any of those i just think we need to just temper our enthusiasm and just say put those on the supporting cast member and not the star of the show that sometimes you hear patients come in while well, they taped me and scraped me and needled me in it uh, and i'm like well how much did you do off the table well a little bit the, the tech would teach me some exercises but the patient's perception was all about the magic juju uh, also elsewhere which yeah frustrating anyway I don't really have anything else I think I would add to the, unless you have anything you wanted to add to the uh, discussion about the old disc. No, but, uh, yeah, you know, I think that <clears throat> I have determined that we need to do a month on, uh, you know, a month in our lifelong learning Academy specifically on, on low back pain and, and maybe some different low back presentations and, and what that looks like and how we go about it. Because I, I don't think that there is a lot of courses out there that, that cover that. And I think that there's a lot of confusion uh, on different schools of thought. Do I, do I do the Maitland approach or do I do the McKinsey approach or do I do the McGill bracing approach or do I do the, uh, you know, whatever core stabilization approach? I, I think that, I think that that's worth, that, that's worth a lot of value to kind of, to kind of walk through that stuff with a lot of people. Yeah, no, I think you do uh, what works best for the patient in the treatment that day in that moment approach that it's going to be colored by our biases of what we're best able to apply. So, but it's, I, to me, it's like have the tools. Maitland's not a treatment. It's a philosophy of reasoning and thinking that they're not really technical. I mean, they do technique instruction, don't get me wrong, but they're not really, they're more worried about how you assess and clinically reason, which I think is a great way that MDT fits well within that framework manipulation fits well within that framework taping scraping cupping needling all those things need to be validated and you need to have a clinical process to do it but yeah there's definitely some clinical patterns that you'll commonly see around low back pain presentations and and uh, we'll, we'll 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 get some things put up and and do some things where we'll 
um, maybe solicit some experts to come on in and, and chat about uh, what they see. Uh, probably see if we get some clinical experts. Not that anything's wrong with the research experts, but I think you know the clinicians are doing the N equals one research every day, each in encounter with each patient that um, forms a lot of the patterns that researchers can then test and do things. So I, I, I think clinical experts would be great, and then you know, maybe get some researchers in there as well. But. Other than that, I think that's all we had for today. So I, hopefully this discussion was helpful and that we didn't get too soapboxy on things and hope you guys enjoyed it. I uh, hope you guys are hope gonna spread some better messages around the lumbar disc and not just lumbar disc, cervical disc. This don't slip like unstable pieces of anatomy that are flip-flopping around in the spine and let's help our patients better understand that and have a better, more adaptive view on it and not pain splain them and, and blast them in the face with you're wrong, but validate where they're at and see if you can create some scenarios where they can consider maybe some alternative ways of thinking about what's going on in their back and then create scenarios where they prove to themselves they can change it on, on their own and it's not a doomsday surgical scenario that often gets painted to them by uh, other folks or the internet and different things like that. So with that, we'll leave you today and hope you all have a great rest of your day. Have a good week. Stay safe out there and we'll talk to you next week. Good discussion. Hold on a second.